It's really interesting when you find out the countries that are hungry for the word and that are open to receive the word. And it's amazing how foreign countries seems to be more open to the word than it is what some are here in America today. So this morning I would like to turn it over to Doug Corbett. So that was the first thing I learned because I was actually uh, giving, I have a really good camera, so I was giving the um, uh, responsibility but also blessing of being a photographer. So while there were people uh, standing around in line waiting um, to see the optometrist, mainly there because we have so many uh, people that wanted to get glasses. I would go through and there were mothers with children and I would ask them if I could take their pictures. So I'd take pictures of their little sweet babies smiling and uh, laughing and, um, and then I would show them to them. I would show them to the children and I would show them to the mothers and of course, every, you know, we all that have children or grandchildren, we love to see pictures of our family and see them happy and smiling. And that was a real blessing, and I was blessed to be able to do this. But this is actually something that I wrote, that I that I uh, read to the people. It was actually after I had spent a week doing the uh, helping with the healthcare facility and seeing, um, you know, how uh, hungry the people were and how uh, how much they needed a, a touch in their life. They needed the touch of Christ but they also needed to know that real people love them and that somebody would actually touch them with their hands and hold them. And uh, the, reason, the reason that I am sensitive to this is because, especially because I did lose you know, my husband, my first husband after 40 years. And so I, uh, I lived alone for, for uh, you know, a couple of years and uh, it's, it's a great loss when you don't have anybody, you know, to hold you at night when you're laying down by yourself in an empty house and it's so quiet. Thank God I got the dog back because that was really helpful. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's like they're here and then they disappear. That's that's the way I that's the way I explain it because sometimes I will think about it and I will say. Where did you go? And I know where he went. I know he's with the Lord, but where is that? In our, you know, in our our fleshly minds, we cannot comprehend it. We take it by faith, and it's only because of our faith that we can see into that world. And the closer we draw to the Lord, and the the more time we spend in His Word, and the more time we spend in prayer, and and become worshipers. Uh, I was thinking of this uh, this song a while ago when we were worshiping. In your presence, in your presence, there's peace. In your presence, in your presence, there's joy. Let me linger, let me stay. 
and your presence every day till your likeness <coughs> will be seen in me. And that's why we spend time in, in his presence. And because we want to become more like him. And how does that happen? It's called a, a metamorphosis. In Romans chapter was a 13 where it talks about us being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That word is, I hope I'm not preaching the sermon. <laughs> metamorphosis is the word. Butterfly. The butterfly, how the larva turns into this beautiful creature and it happens a little bit at a time. And that's so fascinating, but it means metamorphosis. <coughs> and that's what he wants is for us to be transformed into his image. And we're, uh, we're spiritual beings that are, are growing and we are evolving, if you don't mind that word, Amen. into his presence. And here I'm putting two things together, but let me let me show you what I, what I shared. I, I shared, I said, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I count it an honor to stand before you this, this day. And I count it an honor to stand before you folks this day. Because you are Christ's children. And we are, we are his family. And this is, it was my first mission trip with my dear husband, Doug Corbett. And it was my first time to Brazil. My first time to leave the country. This is my first time here today with you folks. And uh, I says, my heart was touched at the number of people that came to the clinic each day. My heart was touched to meet you folks last night. And, you, you know, to see your love for each other and, and your love for the Lord. And, and I said that the Brazilian people, they are friendly, they're compassionate, they're gentle, and they're thankful people. And it was our pleasure to serve them. And it's our pleasure to serve you this morning to be here and share with you what we've been able to, to do, that God has opened the door for me to be with God so that I can, you know, partake of, of ministering to people. And that's why we're, we're called to serve. We're all servants. Like Christ, he, he came to serve us. No, we're called to serve each other. The churches we visited there, they, they opened their hearts to us, and their hearts were full of thankfulness. We... We remember them, we will remember them in our prayers and re when we return to our own homes. And we will remember you in our prayers as we return to our own home. And I said, I will never forget the beautiful country that I experienced. And even I do not, did not know their language. I could see Christ's love and him shining in their hearts and radiating in their smiles. And that was so beautiful that I learned that there were no boundaries and there were no walls in any country, whether I could speak their language or not. In Christ, there are no boundaries. Spiritually, I could relate to them. You know, I could see Christ in their eyes. They could feel him in my spirit, and in, in our spirits were one in Christ. And I just want to um, say God bless you. Thank you for having us. And, uh, and it's just a pleasure to be here today. You can't say enough about the urgency of prayer. I'm a. Yeah, I do have this where it will play. If you want to try to get half again. We uh, have. Nothing like that. What's that? Nothing like live. Yeah, nothing like that. That's it. Anyway, uh, we could, uh, 33 years ago, um, last March, just past March, I was uh, diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it was in my bone marrow. The doctor gave me six months to live without treatment. Uh, but I took the treatment, and uh, here it is 33 years later, I'm still kicking. And uh, the doctors are honest, they'll tell you that they're just practicing medicine. But there is a, a doctor whose name is Jesus that doesn't practice. He's a great physician. He does everything exact and perfect. But that only happens because people pray. And Amen. They see God. And I stand before you today as a product of your prayers. Because had you not been part of our prayer warriors, I probably wouldn't be here today. I have other challenges in my life. I think because of the six rounds of chemo and two rounds of radiation, I had a, a 
bone marrow transplant in 96. I've been cancer free since 96, but now I'm having trouble with my heart as a result of some of those uh, drugs that they gave me 22 years ago. <coughs> Chemo, but you know what we sang today about the heart and about the lungs and about the bones? None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. The God of all gods controls every beat of our heart. Every time our, uh, we breathe in and breathe out, God is in control of that. And he can stop that at any moment. And so we're going to survive. We're going to make it. We're going to go through with the help of the Lord and the, and the help of people that pray for us. Uh, one of the ways we try to recruit prayer warriors, pick up a prayer card out there on the table uh, in the foyer. We also have some things on the table out there that we use on our clinics when we're trying to diagnose people's eye, eye conditions and uh, how we can fit them with eyeglasses that will help them. One of the things that I, I didn't get a chance to mention but should have is that one of the things that healthcare ministries do sometimes is help the local church to grow and to and help the local pastors. Uh, back in 2008, we did a healthcare clinic uh, at an aging pastor's church in a Muslim area of northern Ethiopia. Uh, this was a community that uh, was open, had just opened to Christianity, had been uh, staunchly Muslim before that. And one of the young men who graduated from our Bible school in Addis Ababa. Uh, felt the Lord called him to northern Ethiopia to work in, in a Muslim village. Uh, during and immediately following the medical clinic that we set, um, set up there, we, the church was so small we couldn't do it in the church, so we did it in a community center, and we um, saw patients there. But during that week, the church grew from approximately 100 people to over 500 people. Yeah. And... Um, about three weeks after we got back from the trip, the pastor sent us an email, and uh, this is what he said. He said, our church has expanded since you folks have been here from 100 to almost 500. But he said, the, the most wonderful thing is, is that now when my neighbors see me in the community, they don't spit on me anymore. <laughs> Can you imagine walking outside and when you're the pastor, Pastor Jack, they don't spit on him anymore. That's because they saw something in his heart and in, in the heart of the clinic that uh, let them know that uh, Jesus is real in their lives. Amen. And so I wanted to share that because that's another, another benefit of having Compassion Ministries. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Mark chapter 10, and I want to begin reading at verse 46. <coughs> Anyone who's ever had, uh, when I was in the third grade, I had to wear glasses. And, um, you know, today, today glasses are kind of fashionable. In fact, every time I pack a trip, I always put about a dozen pair of eyeglasses in the suitcase that have absolutely no strength in them at all. They're clear glass. And the reason I do that is because uh, every, almost every time we'll have little guys that are sitting here all week watching people get eyeglasses, and they want a pair of glasses. They don't need a pair of glasses, but they want a pair of glasses. So we'll have them step up to the eye chart, and we'll ask them, can you see the big E at the top of the chart? I can't, I can't even see the chart. I, I need a pair of glasses. So we'll, I'll, I'll test their eyes, and they're 20, 20. They don't need a pair of glasses, but he thinks he needs a pair of glasses. So I reach in there and grab one of those clear lens glasses and put it on the little guy's face. And suddenly a miracle takes place. They can read the bottom line at 20, 2010, and they can read it clearly because they want to have a pair of glasses. When I was a kid, it was a it was a stigma to have a pair of glasses because people would call me four eyes, or they thought I was some kind of a uh, that I had two sets of eyes. Anyone who's ever had to wear glasses, especially as a youngster, knows what it feels like to be teased about them sometimes. I want to speak to you briefly in a brief message this morning regarding the difference between physical vision and spiritual vision. Uh, mentioned jokes have been made about people calling them four eyes or making reference to the idea that they have two sets of eyes. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the inward appearance. 
And in the spiritual realm, it's hardly a curse or a disadvantage to have two sets of eyes. In fact, it's a great blessing to be able to see things from a different perspective than just the natural. Let's read, uh, beginning in verse 46. This is a story of a man who is affectionately known as Blind Bartimaeus. As they came to Jericho, and now you've got to remember in the first part of this chapter, Jesus is, is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the Passion Week. And uh, if you go through the beginning of these uh, verses in that chapter, you'll see where Jesus is talking about the fact that uh, no man, uh, Peter, Peter says to uh, Jesus, uh, uh, I've given my whole life to you, what shall I have? in return. And Jesus said that whosoever leaves her, uh, uh, Jesus says there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my sake, in verse 29, and the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold in this time, hundredfold of houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the world to come eternal life. When I went to Africa the first time, I thought, how in the world can God give me a hundred fathers, a hundred mothers, a hundred houses, a hundred lands in this life? I can, I, I can believe he can do it in the life to come, but in this life, how's he going to do that? Well, you know, after 30 years of being a missionary, 22 in Africa, I can tell you I have more than a hundred Africans that call me their son. Or call me their father. And they, they, say, they, they will say to me, my house is your house. You come and visit me anytime you want. And that's how God rewards uh, me in that passage. But we get down to verse 46. And the Bible says, and then they, <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples, come to Jericho. And as he, <clears throat> as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus means he was the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Bartimaeus began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his, hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says in verse 30, in 49, and Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And when Jesus answered and said unto him, What will you have that I should do unto you? The blind man said to him, That I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately, and immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. It's hardly a curse to have two sets of eyes in the natural. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17, Jesus is talking to the church in Laodicea. And he says to them, because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I will spew you out of my mouth. You see, though, from our point of view, we look at things from one perspective, but God looks at us entirely different. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, it talks to us about the selection of David as king over Israel. And you know the story how Samuel was looking for the next king to follow Saul, and he went to the house of Jesse, and Jesse paraded all of his older sons before Samuel. And Samuel said, not one of those is the one. Do you have any other boys? And Jesse said, I only have one son left. He's the baby, and he's out in the middle of the sheep field out there tending sheep. And Samuel said, bring him to me. And God revealed to Samuel that David was to be the, the next choice, and he anointed him and made him king. The Bible says that we look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the inward appearance. God looks up on the heart of man, not on his outward appearance. And as God looks upon the heart of people, all around the world today. What is God thinking? And what is what is He seeing? Many of us are saying, I'm rich, but I don't need anything. And compared to the rest of the world, we in the West are rich and affluent. 
But still, God answers back to us and says, you don't seem to realize just how spiritually blind and poor and naked you really are without God. Some of you will be familiar with the name Helen Keller. Helen Keller was a great woman who was born blind and deaf. She once said this, I have walked with people whose eyes are full of life, but they see nothing. They see nothing in the woods, nothing in men or sky, nothing in the struggle, nothing in books, nothing in sports, nothing on the street. Their sole voyage through this enchanted world is a barren waste. The prophet Isaiah said once about the nation of Judah, they have eyes to see, but they don't see, and they have ears to hear, but they hear not. Did you know, and do you believe that there's a world out there that we cannot see with our physical eyes. I believe there is a world that we can't see with our physical eyes. It's a world, it's a world of evil and a world of good, a world with demons and a world with angels battling back and forth. I believe there are angels in this place this morning that are hovering around us that we can't see. And there are also evil in this place or evil spirits that the angels of good are holding back. Because we're in a spiritual battle. It's not a recreation room. It's not a, a, it's not a game that we're playing. We're playing with eternal destiny of people. The Bible teaches that there's a world of battling back and forth. You remember the story of Elisha and his servant who were under attack by the armies of the Syrians. In 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. It says this. When the servant of the man of God was risen early. This was Elijah's servant, Elisha's servant. When he was, he rose early and he went out. Behold, he saw, uh, uh, behold, a host com compassed and surrounded the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said to Elisha, "Alas, my master, what are we going to do?" Elijah, Elisha answered back to his servant, "Don't be afraid, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them." Amen. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that you open my servant's eyes that he can see. And the Bible says the Lord opened the eyes of that young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite the enemy, the people of Syria, with blindness, I pray. The Bible says that the armies of the Syrians never knew what happened to them because there were, there were uh, angels and chariots of fire that couldn't be seen with the physical eye, but it could be seen with the spiritual eye. Amen. Now, the chief character in our little story this morning is a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus lived in the city of Jericho where he struggled to survive all of his life by begging and living off of other people's throwaways. And on this particular morning, as he always did every day, he carefully made his way to his spot to beg at the city gate along the main road, and he began to cry out and he began to beg. He probably said something like, Alms for the poor! Please help the blind! And people would come by like they do in Africa. You see lots of begging in Africa. People would come by, some of them were very cruel. Some of them would spit at him. Some of them would throw rocks at him. Some may have kicked him. Maybe some have robbed him. How would he know what was in his cup? People would take from the poor. Once in a while, a stranger would throw in a small coin into his, into his uh, can. There were other beggars there, too, to compete for what little bit they might get, anything to just get by, anything to eke out a, 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 a meager existence. I want, us to, I want us this morning to examine this blind man, Bartimaeus, for a moment and notice his basic needs. He had three basic needs. First of all, he was blind. Second of all, he was poor. And third of all, as the pastor referred to this morning, he was in a hopeless condition. He was desperate. <clears throat> First of all, the Bible says that he was blind. In verse 46, it says, blind, the blind man, Bartimaeus. 
Bartimaeus couldn't see the rags or the filth. He also couldn't appreciate any of the beauty that was around him. The Bible teaches that you and I have two sets of eyes too. Your physical eyes may have 20-20 vision, but your spiritual eyes may be completely blinded. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we can be blinded by a supernatural power. That's why when I, before I came to Christ, I couldn't make heads or tails out of the Word of God. I would read the Bible and fall asleep. I would read the Bible and it became, I didn't understand it. And it's because the Bible teaches us that Satan blinds the eyes of unbelievers until you come to Christ and God gives you a spiritual eyesight and suddenly what was once boring and, and uninteresting to you becomes alive because you see it from a spiritual aspect and not the physical. 1 Corinthians chapter 21 verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 14, the natural mind receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. In 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 4, the Bible says, The God of this world, that is the devil, has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In other words, there is a spiritual veil that comes over our minds and over our spiritual eyes. And that's why a person can never come to, to Christ or to God by intellect alone. They have to come by faith. They have to come by believing in the finished work of Calvary. The gospel doesn't make sense to somebody who only has physical sight. You can't figure out logically step by step because sin has affected your spiritual thinking processes. The world thinks the gospel of Jesus is foolish because Satan has blinded them. And as I spend more and more of my years in the United States, I see that this is becoming a, 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 probably the biggest problem in our nation is that people are, are denying the truth of Christianity because they can't see with any spirituality at all. It's all trying to see through uh, the, the, the physical processes and it doesn't make sense. It's foolishness to them. The world thinks that Jesus is foolish. The Bible deliberately uses the word foolishness when it refers to what the world thinks about the gospel. You remember another story in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5. It's the story of a general uh, in chief by the name of Naaman, who is uh, the, the chief uh, leader, military leader of the nation of Syria. The Bible says he was a, a great man. It says he was a brave man. He was a, he was a, a honorable man, but he had one problem, and that is he was a leper. He had leprosy, and he didn't seem like he could find a cure, so he went to see the prophet of God, Elisha, to find out if he could help him. He went down to the local cornerstone assembly to see if he could find an answer to his problem. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, and verses 10 through 12, the Bible says Elisha, when he heard about uh, Naaman's need, instead of Elisha going out and meeting this general of the Syrian army, which is what Naaman expected would happen, he sent a messenger to him. And he said to Naaman, this messenger said to Naaman that Elisha says, you go and wash in the Jordan River seven times and your flesh will come again to you and you will be made clean. Well, that made Naaman very angry because here he is, a military general, and he's coming to see the prophet and the prophet doesn't even take time to come and see me personally. He sends the little boy. He sends the messenger. And he went away and he said, behold, I thought that Elisha would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord as God and strike his hand over the place and recover my, my uh, heal my leprosy. Then he said, he wants me to dip seven times in the Jordan River. The waters of Abana and Parfar, rivers in Damascus, are better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? And so the Bible says he turned and he went away in a huff, in a rage. Naaman left Elisha in a rage. Why should he do such a foolish thing? There's no medical power in the Jordan River. 
It seemed very foolish to Naaman, but you see, he had to go dip in that water, not, not by sight, but he had to do it by faith. It was a faith thing to Naaman. Obedience is very important. God was trying to teach Naaman obedience. He has to do something foolish. Foolish to the natural mind, but not foolish to God. It's a matter of obedience. Another story in Numbers chapter 21. You remember in the Old Testament, the children of Israel are out in the wilderness, and snakes are biting them. And they're dying from snake bite. And so what Moses decides to do is to put up a pole with the head of a serpent on it. And he said to them, whenever you uh, are bit by a snake, look up at the image of the snake and you'll be healed. That's foolishness. No medical power in a bronze serpent. But God was telling them to do something foolish by faith. The cross of Calvary was foolishness to the natural mind. But the power of all heaven is locked up in the secret of the cross. It's about the cross. It's about the blood of Jesus. That's why the cross is the symbol of Christianity. It looks foolish and ridiculous, but there's power to change lives in the cross. And so second of all, Bartimaeus was blind, but he, like so many folks today, but he was also poor. The Bible says, again in verse 46, he sat by the roadside begging. He was poor. Now that's a problem that's still with us today, the problem of poverty. Think about this. Seven out of ten people in the world today are living in abject poverty. Seven out of ten. They're literally fighting to survive. Every single day that goes by in our world, we're, we're not aware of it here in the West, but every day, more than 25,000 people are dying of starvation and, mal and malnutrition every day in the world. And the real tragedy is that 16,000 of those 25,000, two-thirds of them are children under the age of five. You think about that, 25,000. I looked up last night the population of Cape Girardeau, 40, about 40,000 in Cape Girardeau. That means every single day, Two-thirds of Cape Girardeau would die from starvation. And tomorrow, another two-thirds of the, a city of the size of Cape would die from starvation. In some places, the dogs and the cats have a better standard of living than millions of human beings in other parts of the world because poverty is a problem around the world. The Bible teaches that we have a responsibility to the poor of this world. Proverbs 21, 13, whoever stops his ears to the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Psalm 41 and verse 1, blessed is he that considers the poor, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. 1 John 3.17, whoever has this world's goods and, and sees his brother in need and shuts up his vows of compassion from him, how does the love of God dwell in him? And while we have a definite responsibility to the poor of this world, we must also keep in mind that we are to do all we possibly can to do our part. I saw a sign the other day that said, I fight poverty, I work. I fight poverty. I work. But I know there are some people who won't work no matter what. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, if any would not work, neither should he eat. The work ethic is straight from God. His son Jesus knew what it was to work and to work hard. There's dignity in doing a full day's work, whether it's picking up the garbage or being a maid or working as an executive somewhere. There's something dignified about earning your own way in life. But there's another kind of poverty besides physical poverty that's much worse, and it's spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty, far worse. Psalm 37, verse 16, the little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Matthew 16, 26, 
For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus told the story of the rich man in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. The man said, I will say to my soul, he said it to his soul, not his mind or his body, but I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. That's exactly how some Christians are. Don't get involved in social concerns. Don't get involved in church work. Don't sing in the choir. Don't witness. Don't tithe. Just spend it all on yourself. And God says, you're a fool. Thy soul shall be required of thee. If you've done any study of history, the fall of Rome came about because of three main things. Because of gluttony, because of drunkenness, and because of immorality. It ate the heart and the core out of that great civilization. And there are things right now, my friends, that will eat the very, the very heart and soul out of us in America if we don't have a moral and a spiritual revival from coast to coast and have it very quickly. You see, there's a spiritual poverty which is much worse than natural poverty. We can, we can give everyone here food and clothing and new houses and free education and money. You know, if I had the, if I had the ability to, give, to feed the world and to clothe the naked in the world and to educate the ignorant in the world and to house the homeless in the world, if I could feed and clothe and educate and house everybody in this world and never tell them about Jesus, all I would generate are well-fed, well-housed, well-called, well-educated sinners who will still die and go to hell because they're living in spiritual poverty. And they don't know the Lord and they don't know that they're living there. You may have a good job. You may be here this morning, you have a nice bank account, a good standing in the community, but you can still be spiritually poor at the same time. In God's sight, and that's all that really matters, you can be like Bartimaeus. You can be poor and you can be blind. Finally, number three, not only was Bartimaeus blind and poor, but he was also in a hopeless condition. In verses 49 and 50 in our text, it says, Jesus stood still and commanded Bartimaeus to be called, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good cheer, rise, he calleth thee. And it says, He cast away Casting away his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. It was his moment of desperation. He tried many times before to find a cure for his blindness, but he couldn't no matter what he did. How many people are there today in the same condition? They're in a desperate condition. They're at the end of their rope. They don't know where else to go. Psychiatrists today call our society a suicide mentality. And they're saying that the higher the civilization, the higher the suicide rate is among even children. I believe that Bartimaeus fully expected that he was going to die in his blindness. He couldn't see any ray of hope for himself. Every day was the same routine, down to the begging spot, hoping somebody would have mercy on him. He was in a desperate condition. How many people in our world today, how many people in this city today have given up hope that there'll ever come change in their life? They're like the cat that's had his tail stepped on so many times that every time someone comes into the room, he just sticks it out again and lets them walk on it. You might have said, maybe you're here today and you might, you might have even said, there's no use. I've tried everything. In Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone was a former slave colony of Britain. And they had a saying among the, and they still have a slave mentality, what are you going to do for us today? And they had a saying in Creole that said, how for do, which means what can you do? It's hopeless. We just give up. I've, 
Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you've said, I've tried everything. I've tried this church. I've tried that church. I've tried philosophy. I've tried psychology. Maybe you've even thought this morning about ending it all. But I've come to ask you, have you ever tried Jesus? I mean, really tried Jesus. You see, spiritually, every one of us are hopeless. Without God, I am hopeless. I'm desperate. I'm at the end of my rope without Christ in my life. Many of us have realized that we are in hopelessness without Jesus and there is no hope. So there sat old, poor, blind, and hopeless Bartimaeus doing his everyday routine. When all of a sudden he heard boys begin to whistle and people were laughing. And he cried out and he said, who's coming? Nobody answered him. And so he said it again a little louder, who's coming? Still no answer came from the confusion and the crowd seemed to be passing him by. And so he grabbed the clothes of a passerby and he said, I said, who's coming? And the stranger jerked loose from Bartimaeus and said, it's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Bartimaeus said, Jesus of Nazareth, I've heard of him. He's the one who's been doing all those miracles. I've heard of him. You see, Jesus was passing by Jericho, just like right now he's passing by here. <clears throat> and in desperation, Bartimaeus could have said, you know what? I think I'll wait for the religious leaders to tell me all there is to know about this guy. But he didn't do that. He, did not, he didn't wait until he could understand more about Jesus. Until he could understand more about theology. He didn't wait because he was desperate. And he said, no, this is my one big moment. And he yelled at the top of his lungs, Jesus, have mercy on me. And I want you to notice, in verse 49, the Bible says, and Jesus stopped. When Bartimaeus cried in his desperation, the Bible says, Jesus stopped. Think about that. This was the last time that Jesus was ever going to be in Jericho. And he was already almost out of the earshot from Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was taking this once in a lifetime chance. And he cried out in his desperation, Jesus have mercy on me. And the Bible says, Jesus stopped. Among all the hubbub, among all the whistling and the laughter and the, and the loud crowd, Jesus heard his desperate cry and he stopped. Let me tell you something, friend. If you'll call out to Jesus today, he'll stop. Try. And he'll listen to you. And he'll hear your very cry. The other beggars probably tried to stop him from making a fool out of himself. But it was too late. And Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do? How can I help you? Now don't you think Jesus already knew what Bartimaeus' need was? Jesus knew that Bartimaeus was blind. But Jesus still asked him, what do you want me to do for? I believe that Jesus wanted to know if Bartimaeus really wanted to be changed. Do you know there's a lot of people in our world today who love their sins so much that they don't want to give them up? They love their condition so much that they like to complain about it. I've met sick people who enjoy being sick. They enjoy telling you about it over and over and over. They enjoy complaining about it. They enjoy the attention it gives them. And Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do? Because Jesus wanted to know if Bartimaeus really wanted to be made whole. I want you to notice the Bible says in Mark 10, 52, immediately, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. 
Most of the people in the Bible who met Jesus just met him for an instant or for a moment or for an hour, but they were never the same after they met Jesus. After they had touched Jesus, after they had cried out in desperation to Jesus, they never were the same. The Bible says a miracle happened in Bartimaeus' life immediately, suddenly, he received the sight after so many years of being desperately blind. Remember in the book of Acts when Paul and Silas were in jail and the earthquake came and freed them from their bond, from their, uh, from their chains and an angel opened the door and the Philippian jailer uh, was about to kill himself and Paul said, don't kill yourself, we're all here, we haven't escaped. That, that jailer said to Paul, sir, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't give that jailer some complicated list of do's and don'ts and you can't do this and you can't do that and you shouldn't do this. Didn't give him a list of religious regulations. What Paul said to that jailer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your house. A simple answer to a complicated question. Very simple. I'm sure that if you would have taken Paul to a psychiatrist or to a psychologist, or taken that jailer to a psychiatrist, they would have told you that this man was in no emotional condition to make a decision like that. His emotions had just been shaken by an earthquake. But Paul just simply said to that man, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And that night, that man's life was changed. Now finally this morning, I want to say to you, what about you? What about your second set of eyes? Have, you ever, have they ever been opened to the goodness of God by the Holy Spirit? Are you living a life that you can see with your spiritual eyesight? That you are, that you are uh, living in spiritual poverty? You might be the richest guy on this side of town, but you can still be spiritually poor without the Lord. I want to pray for you, and then I'm going to turn this service back to Pastor Oliver and have him uh, bring a close to it. But let me pray for you this morning. Father, I thank you so much for these wonderful people in this church and, and what they're doing to keep preaching the gospel in this end of town. Father, as they reach out to their neighbors and their friends in this community, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will go with them and that you'll give them not only the physical strength, but you also give them spiritual discernment and spiritual power to know how to, how to speak to people, open windows of opportunity for them, Lord, help them to see Jesus in their lives, help them, Lord, to realize that without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing, but as we rest and rely on you, Lord, help us to do amazing things for you and bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ. Because we know that your coming is very soon. And what we do, we want to do quickly. And we want to do effectively. So help us, Lord, to be that person you want us to be. And we're thankful and careful to give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor Jack. Thank you. 